I like that song. I like that song. Turn to John chapter 8. Do what? Did a real good job. Uh, you know, it, it kind of goes along with what I'm talking about tonight in John chapter 8. Now, you remember we were in John chapter 8 last week where Jesus said, you know, if the Son of Man is lifted up, then uh, I'm going to draw all men to me. And we talked about that. Well, this is the next verses that kind of go along with that. And uh, it, it builds on it. You know, I've thought about it before. On any given Sunday, I don't know how many churches we have in the United States. I can't remember. It seemed like we moved to Danville, Virginia in 1972. And I want to say, wasn't there like 100 churches in Danville in 1972? In one town. 100. And, and you know, you, and of course, I was only 12 then, so I didn't think a whole lot about it. But, you know, I think about it now and think, why? There's one God. <laughs> you know, it's because people can't get along. I can tell you that. I mean, it's called sinful human beings, okay? That's the reason. But I, I don't know how many churches we have in our country or even in our state. Uh, we could narrow it down to just our county. Uh, you know, but on any given Sunday, how many sermons are preached? Golly, hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. And you got to stop and think. What are they all preaching about? You know? How many? Hopefully they preaching about Jesus, yes. Hopefully they preaching the Word, all right? But not every one of them preaches on the same thing, okay? So why some preach on one thing and others preach on another? I, you know, it's because of the leading of the Holy Spirit. He knows that this group of people over here needs one thing, and this group of people over here needs another. And that's why he leads pastors to preach on different things. And, uh, and and hopefully if the pastor's doing his job, he's preaching what God wants his people here, you see. Uh, so I don't know what how many sermons are preached on any given Sunday, okay? I don't know what all of them preach about. I ain't worried about what everybody else preaches about. I'm trying to worry about what I'm supposed to preach about. You know, but I do know this, that these sermons could probably be categorized in about three different ways, all right? Number one... They're evangelistic sermons that are preached to people who are just lost and need salvation. Okay? Or, number two, they are preached to people who are already saved and, and they need to be encouraged uh, in living the Christian life and growing in their Christian life, in their spiritual life. But I think there's probably a third category we could throw in here and this is the one Christ was talking about right here. I think probably there are some sermons that are preached for those people who think they're saved, but they're not. You know, you say, well, you know, if somebody tells you they're saved, well, you know, what can you do? Well, you know, you can't judge, obviously, and you don't know, only God knows. But, but you know what? The Lord Himself said, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. It's a sad thing to think about uh, how many people who are members of churches and had been for years that are lost? They've never totally committed themselves to Christ, and that's what Christ was talking about here. You know, what do you say to people like that? You know, uh, several years ago they did a poll, and and they wanted to find out just how people felt about their spiritual life and about God and things like that. So they did a, a huge poll. They talked to, a, you know, probably millions of people across the United States and Great Britain. And they found that in this poll, 90%, 90% of the people polled said they believe in a personal God. But that's kind of open-ended, isn't it? You know, I'm starting to think about it. If 90% of them, and I'm just going to play with it a little bit, bit here, but if 90% of those people polled said they believed in a personal God, instead of saying that, if they'd have said, I believe in the one true God, and 90% of them said it, but yet look where we are in our culture and our country today and where Great Britain is, some of them didn't really believe it, did they? I mean, stop thinking about it. Look at what's going on in our country. Look, they don't believe it. If they say they believe, if they said that they believed it and they really believed it, we wouldn't have gotten this shape to begin with. Let me tell you something. 
churches would be packed every Sunday if 90% of our population believed in the one true God and were committed to following Him, we wouldn't have a problem with church attendance. I can tell you. We wouldn't have a problem with reaching our communities for Christ. We wouldn't have a problem in the politicians because people who are godly would make them stand up for what's right. Folks, we wouldn't have all these problems, but we have these problems. And you know what? That just tells me that Christ said it right. He is truthful. He cannot lie. He said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And sadly, a lot of those people are probably in our churches. I often wondered what would happen if the rapture took place during Sunday morning worship. <laughs> Might be some surprise folks sitting in deep, hey? Let's read together John chapter 8. We're going to start with verse 30. Now remember, Jesus had just told the people there, he said, if the Son of Man is lifted up, I'll draw them into me. Well, in verse 30, he goes on and he says this, or it says this, as he spoke these words, many believed on him. No way to translate it, or translate that is, many believed in him. Okay, as he spoke those words, there were a lot of people there who believed in Christ. But then he goes on. And he says, and Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him or in him, okay, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. He was talking to those Jewish people right there that really were believers. They had committed to it. They believed in Christ, okay? That's who he was talking to there. He says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Boy, that's a good verse right there. You will know the truth. You know, I, I love these verses. Jerry, wish I had Mike here because me and him get some good discussions about the truth. I mean, you know, it's philosophical debates. But listen, it, it ain't that difficult. Jesus said it right there. If you believe in me, you'll know the truth and it'll make you free. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will be with us tonight. Teach us from your word. And Lord, may we learn what we need to learn so that we might better serve you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. You see, there's two kinds of belief. And I know you think, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> that ain't what the Bible says. Well, you know what? The Bible backs me up on this, and if you'll pay attention just a minute, maybe I can make it clear to you. There's really two kinds of belief, okay? And, and Christ addresses those right here. Uh, first of all, there's a big difference in believing that Christ was here and believing in Christ. There's a big difference between believing what Christ said and believing in Christ. You get the you get the you see the difference there. There's a whole big difference between just believing that he was here and believing that what he said was true. You know what? You talk to the Muslims nowadays. You talk to people of the Islamic faith, and they will tell you Christ was a great man. That Christ was a good, a good prophet. What he said was good. But they ain't saved. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. They just believe what he said. There's a difference, folks. And there's a lot of people sitting in church pews and everywhere else around this country and even in our community, they believe, oh yeah, I believe in the Bible, boy. I believe every word in there. I believe that God's a good guy and He said some good things. And if we live by that, we'll be all right. But they never darken the doors of church. You know why? Because they don't believe in Christ. They have never committed to Him and, and asked Him to come into their heart. People say, is this possible? Of course it is. Of course it's possible to believe Christ or believe that Christ existed and not believe in Christ and accept Him as your Savior. There are examples in the Bible. The biggest one y'all can name right off the top of your head is Judas. Judas was one of the disciples. God chose him to be one of the disciples. Okay? He believed what Christ said. When they were sent out two by two, guess what? He went out and he preached about what Christ said and said, this is the truth. But we found out that he wasn't saved. He believed what Christ said, but he didn't believe in Christ in his heart. You know, there was another one, Simon Magus. He was even baptized. I mean, they baptized him, you know, and then Peter had to get on to him for his unbelief. He went through all the motions. He did everything. He went through the ritual. He did everything. That, that the church said needed to be done to show that you were a Christian. He did all that, but yet he didn't believe. You know what? The Bible even says that the demons believe and tremble 
You know why they tremble? They believe what he said is true. And if what he said is true, it ain't looking good for them at the end of the game, I can tell you. That's why they tremble. Even the devil believes, but he doesn't believe in Christ for salvation. There is a difference, folks. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Each one of these people believed certain things about Christ, but they weren't saved because they didn't believe in Him. You know, back, I don't know, it was 1800s, I guess, there was a, a guy that got famous. He was from France. And I can't remember his real name. It was Jacques or Jean or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, uh, I, I don't know French. Uh, but anyway, he, he, you know, he, he was very famous worldwide, and he was an acrobat, and he would walk tight ropes and everything. He went by the stage name of Blondin. And he came to America, and he decided he was going to prove that he was the greatest acrobat around. And so they put a tightrope across Niagara Falls. And, and he walked across it. And then he decided to make things interesting. And so he looked at a particular fella, and he said, want to take a ride? And he said, what do you mean? Put this guy on his back, walked across Niagara Falls on a tightrope, turned around, and came back with this guy on his back. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's pretty amazing, Okay. He put the guy down and the crowd was gathered around and he happened to look at one guy down here and he says, do you believe that I could carry you across Niagara Falls just like I did him? And the guy said, of course, I just watched you do it. He said, well, hop on. And the guy said, not on your life. <laughs> guy was smart. I ain't getting on your back and let you tote me across that thing. Huh? -uh. No way. Okay. He said, not on your life. And you know what? There's a lot of people that do that with Christ. They say, hey, we saw you do it. We believe you can do it. But we ain't going to let you do it for us. See, there's a difference in believing someone and believing in someone. Folks, there's two different kinds of beliefs. Look, difference in believing on an intellectual level and trusting him with your heart to carry you through. See, that's the difference. you got to trust Him. Christ was speaking to those people who only believed intellectually right here at times. But let me tell you something about Jesus. He sees faith. Jesus sees faith. And when I talk about faith, I'm talking about, you know what? It takes a certain amount of faith just to believe, but it takes a greater faith to accept. Now Christ... He says, if you continue in my word. Stop and think about that. Have you ever met somebody and started witnessing somebody and they have been studying the scriptures and they're searching, but they haven't come to a point of salvation yet? You know, you can encourage them all you want to. And here's what I always tell them. You know, I've talked to people, so yeah, I've read the Bible and this is an interesting verse to me. How would you how would you explain this? I love getting in those kind of conversations with people. You know why? It, it, mean, it tells me that they're looking. They're searching. They, they are curious. And if they have that much faith to start looking, you know what I always, and of course I try to lead in Christ, but here's the thing. If they don't make, make a, a profession right then, uh, while I'm talking to them that day, here's what I do. I encourage them to keep looking right here. Keep studying the Bible. Keep studying the Scripture. That's what Christ did. He said, if you continue in my word. See, Christ sees when there's that spark there. He sees when there's that little bit of faith. And He encourages that to a greater faith, a saving faith. And folks, that's what we need to do with people. But guess what? Once we become saved, we need to continue to grow in that faith. Okay? We have to keep going. Like I was talking about this morning, we got to keep traveling. We got to grow in our faith. That's what we have to do. Christ sees faith. I remember uh, I read a story about Charles Spurgeon one time. Some of the stuff that he wrote, and he wrote something about when he was a boy, he would go out and he would try to build him a little fire. And he said, you know, I put some kindling down there. He called it tinder. He was from England, but anyway, he, he you know, he put the, the kindling down there, and he would try to get a spark. And he said, you know, you. You finally get a spark that lands on that kindling and it's just a little tiny spark. He said, but you get down there and you blow it. And you encourage it. And he said, you can take one tiny little spark and before you know it, you got a great big fire. And you see, that's what he said that Christ does. When he was talking about 
this verse, he said, Christ encourages that kind of faith. There may just be a little bitty spark in your life right now, but God encourages it. God gently blows on it. You keep on, and sooner or later, you're going to catch fire. You know, come think of it, we need some Christians to do that. Don't we? we need some Christians to do that. Look, he said, if you follow my teaching, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth and you will be saved. You see, Jesus sees that faith, but he encourages us to keep moving. Basically, there's three inducements here in, this, in these verses of Scripture. He, there's three things he talks about. He says, if you continue in my word, if you hold to my teachings, you are my disciples, you are saved. You know, there are a lot of people that profess to be saved, but you would never know it until they tell you that. It ought to be the other way around, hasn't it? it? It ought to be the fact, you know, people, you ought to be able to look at somebody and say, that person's a Christian by the way they're living, by the way they're acting, by the way they're talking, by the way they conduct themselves out in the world. You ought to just know that they're a Christian. Let me tell you something. I, I worry about me. I do. I worry about me sometimes. And I wonder, can people tell that I'm a Christian? Now, I know none of y'all have ever faced it, but I'm being honest. I'm going to tell you, you know, some of my shortcomings. There are times when I'm out doing something and something will make me mad. And I know that don't happen to y'all, but it does to me, okay? How do you act when that happens? Because somebody's watching. Somebody's watching, okay? How do you act when that happens? Do you act like a Christian? You know, Robert Zacharias, I was talking to Mary Beth and Mr. Milby this morning, and I told her, I said, look, you, you get us something ready. She said, well, I, I got I to gotta put a slideshow together because you need to see the picture. I said, you get it ready. Let me know. You can have Sunday morning again. We want to hear about it. We want to talk about it. And she said, well, you know, it was, it was interesting. I got off the plane in New Delhi, and I was standing in line at Customs, and there was a young lady standing there, and it turned out that she was from Cambridge, England. And she said, I started talking to her. And uh, she said, well, you know, you're from Cambridge. What is your interest in India? And she said, well, I've just always been fascinated by India, and I wanted to come here. And Mary Beth saw an opportunity, and she said, have you ever heard of Ravi Zacharias? And I'm going, yes. Man, yeah, anybody you can tell him to read other than God, he's the one. I love this guy. Anyway, he, uh, you know, they got to talking, and she started witnessing as soon as she got off the plane. And I thought, that was fast. She said, yeah, no time to waste. I like that. <laughs> I like that. There are three inducements right here that Christ talking about. He says, if you continue in my teachings, you are my disciples. In other words, if you continue in my word, yeah, you're saved. You are my disciples indeed. That means exclamation point. You are truly my disciple. He said, if you hold to my teaching. But there are some people that profess to be Christians. You never know. You never know until they tell you. <coughs> you know, it's like I told you last Sunday morning. I went to town before church over there and I walked in. I, well, I mean, I was just walking in. I wasn't paying attention to how I was acting or anything like that. I was just being me. And this lady walked up to me and she said, you're a preacher, ain't you? You know, I told y'all that last Sunday. And I said, well, what, what makes you say that? You know, I was kind of throw her off a little bit. See, what, what, what? I said, what, what in the world make you say that? She said, you look like a preacher. I said, well, what does a preacher look like? She said, you. <laughs> How do you answer that one, you know? I said, no, I'm curious. Why do you say that? She said, because you look happy. I said, thank you, Lord. I was happy that morning. I said, thank you, Lord, that she saw something that didn't look like me, and it looked like you. We ought to pray that prayer about ourselves every day. We ought to be out there in the community and people ought to look at us and say, that's a Christian without us ever opening our mouth. Folks, that's what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Can others see Christ in you? The first inducement is, hey, if you continue in my word, you're saved. The second one is, you shall know the truth. Now, boy, I could really get started on this, but I promise you I'm going to keep it short tonight, okay? I could go to town on truth. Let me tell you something. I, mm, mm. Look, when Christ said you shall know the truth, He said that you will be certain of spiritual things. 
Okay, you will be certain. There's not going to be any gray area. You know what? Most of us who have been Christians for any length of time and we studied God's Word, any given situation comes up, we know what we're supposed to do. We are certain of what we're supposed to do because that's what God tells us we're supposed to do. And that's what has worked in the past. God says, if you do this, this will happen. And we've seen it prove true. So we are certain of spiritual things as Christ's children. But nowadays, in our culture, truth is relative. It's relative. What if people say, wait a minute, what do you mean it's relative? Well, there are no absolutes anymore. There's no such thing as absolute love. There's no such thing as altruism. You know, I, I may have shared this with y'all. I was taking a class at Mercer, and it was a psychology class. And I, I enjoyed psychology. I like messing with the professors. Of course, I did that with Christianity professors bad. They hated to see me come. But anyway, uh, you know, we had this psychology class, and, uh, and they were talking about there, there is no such thing as altruism. altruism. It doesn't exist. And, and I'm sitting there, and I'm going, wait a minute, yeah, there it is. Yeah, there it is. But I, I, I kept my mouth shut at the moment. And anyway, I, I, uh, they kept saying, you know, uh, people say that you can prove it's altruistic because let's say that a house catches fire and the parents are outside and they realize one of their children is still inside and they instinctively, that's where they started, run back into the house to save their child. And people said, that's absolute love. That's altruistic. But it's not. That's just uh, an animal thing. It is instinctively built into you to save your offspring so that your line does not die. And I went, yeah. I said, so what you're telling me is that those parents don't really love that child. They just don't want their, their gene pool to die out. And they said, that's right. That's not altruism. That's just nature taking over. And I said, okay, I'm going to ask you a question about it. A year or two before that, that airplane went down in the Potomac River in Washington. I said, you remember when that happened? And this professor came and said, yeah, I remember that happened. I said, do you remember watching that on TV when they were rescuing those people? He said, yeah, I remember. I said, how many did they lose? He said, one. I said, was that one kin to anybody on that airplane? No. But if you watched it, there was one man. Every time they went to get him, he would pass that lifeline off to another person until everybody else was saved. He didn't know he wasn't kin to him, nothing. All the others got saved. They went back to get him, and he was gone. He had already frozen to death and gone to the bottom of the Potomac River. And you know what? If I had to guess, I'd say that man was Christian. That's all truism right there. That's the love of God. And you can't explain that away with something. I said, so what was that? It wasn't some instinctive need for his gene pool to survive. It was altruistic. It was because he loved those other people more than he loved himself. But nowadays they say, well, there's no such thing as truth. There's no such thing as absolute. Some people say, well, that may be true for you, but it ain't true for me. Let me tell you something. If God said it, it's true for everybody. It don't matter who it is. It's true for everybody. And God said, guess what? For those of you who accept me and follow my word, continue my word, and live a life that's pleasing me, you're going to heaven one day. But also, he said, for those people who reject me, they're going somewhere else. And you know what? It's going to be the same for everybody that rejects him. And you know what? Just because it's right for you don't mean it's right for me. That, that's crazy. That's crazy. You know what? We get this relative idea of, of truth and everything. Everything is relative. In other words, if, if what's right for you is not right for me, let me tell you something. You know what? If it continues in that direction, we're going to have courtrooms that are full of people who are guilty of murder, and they'll stand up and say, Judge, you know what? It was right for me to kill that person on that day because of this. And the judge is going to have to say, Okay, you can go. Relativism will kill this country. Especially when it comes to truth. Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. But let me tell you something. When he said it will make you free, it will make you free indeed. Let me tell you something. 
you'll know the truth and it'll make you free. And I, I read another story one time about a uh, lady that, that lived in China. She grew up in China. She was 82 years old when they got her out. Communism had already taken over. Okay. And she had been in a communist country so long that when they finally were able to get her out, and they started talking to her that even her speech was laced with the terminology of communism. It had to be when she was living in communist China because if you didn't talk like they wanted to, they'd kill you. And it was habit for her. But she kept using one word. And it was liberation. Now, when most people think about liberation, what do they think about? They think about freedom. They think about freedom. And so there were some Christians talking to her. And they asked her some questions. And, and of course, she was still using this word uh, liberation and all that. And they, they asked her this question, were you free to worship with other Christians? And she said, oh, no. Since the liberation, no one is together for Christian service. <coughs> Don't sound like freedom to me, does it? Do you? And she, they asked her, oh, I said, did you meet in small groups and talk about the Christian faith? She said, oh, no. Such meetings were forbidden since the liberation. You see how Satan twists things? He wants them to think they're free from everything, but they're in bondage. They said, were you free to read your Bible? Since the liberation, no one is free to read the Bible. I'm going to throw this in for free. And I try not to get into politics, okay? <coughs> That's coming here if this next election don't go right. You better thank God for the opportunity to meet in the house of worship and worship with your brothers and sisters in Christ right now because it, it might be real close to being gone. Amen. You know what? I'll be here. Y'all come join me if you want to. We'll all go to prison again. And when we get there, I got a good idea. Let's have church. Amen. Folks, I'm telling you, I don't want to mention any names, but if Bernie Sanders gets elected, that joke is popular. <laughs> Amen. He's a communist. Amen. Yeah, and, and this lady, that I, this is a true story. She said, we were liberated, but we weren't free to study our Bible. Let me tell you something. This has been coming for years and years. Satan has had this plan for a long time. In the 1700s, a man gave a list to a certain group of people and said, if you want to dominate the world, this is what you do. And you know one of the things he put on there? There's a list of 26 of them. I got them in the house. I started to write this down, but I didn't want to bore you with it. But let me tell you something. 26 things he said you got to do. You read them, and you see them happening right now. Every one of them. But let me tell you, one of the things he says is encourage numerous religions except Christianity. Destroy it. And you, you know what? That is proof to me that Christianity is the only true faith. Because if Satan wants it destroyed, but he'll let all the others go, this is the one. This is the one. So you can mark it down when it happens and it's going to. They're going to destroy Christianity in this country if they can. But you know what? I hope that our faith is strong. Jesus said, look, you continue in my word, you're saved. Let me, uh, you know, there's going to come a time when we're going to have some Christian martyrs in this country. And I just hope we're strong enough to stand up to it. Folks, let me tell you something. When Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, he wasn't just talking about a word. He was talking about the hour. See, that word freedom, it don't mean a thing. When Christ said, you shall be free, this is what he was talking about being free from. He was talking about being free from Satan. He was talking about being free from sin. And he was talking about being free from himself. You know, we all know Satan's going to tempt us. We all know Satan's going to tempt us. We know it's coming. I mean, Satan, that's his job, okay? We know that's coming. And yes, we sin. We try not to. And we can give forgiveness. And we can, we can be freed from the chains of those sins. But you know what I worry about more than anything else? I worry about me. I want to be free from myself. I got, I got it in my Bible. Unless it's falling out. Pages are about to fall out. But if I can find it right quick, I'll read it to you again. It's a, it's a Puritan prayer. I say I got it in my Bible. It's somewhere in here. I'll find it as soon as I say, well, we'll read it next time or something. 
It's a Puritan prayer that a friend of mine had written down and had in his Bible, and he handed it to me to read one day. And I said, man, I need to go copy this down. He said, keep that one. I got another copy. But basically, you know, it was a Puritan prayer, and the gist of the prayer said this, Lord, save me from myself. The enemy is within the citadel. You know, save me from myself. When Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, he just wasn't setting you free from your sin. And he wasn't just setting you free from the bondage of Satan. He set you free from yourself. I'll tell you something. You want to know why I sleep so good? I'm talking to Christian people. Are you really free? Have you really committed to Christ? That's something we better be asking ourselves and wrestling with every day. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you love us enough to give us the truth. And Lord, you love us enough to show us the way. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would continue in your word I pray, Heavenly Father, that each and every person that's here tonight is saved indeed, that we are your disciples. But, Heavenly Father, may we not be satisfied with just being saved. Lord, may we go forward and serve you. Father, I pray. And I thank you for the freedom that we find in you. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you save us from our sin. Lord, help us as we live life as your servants. And we'll pray for us in your name. Amen.